I want to come back just to Tammy for one moment on where we began uh, about an hour ago with Liu Xiaobo. Uh, and that is just to say as a, uh, well, first of all, I, you told me just before the event that, that you had met him on a few occasions. Um, but I wonder if you have any reflections and also any thoughts as an editor um, to, uh, you know, say a few words as to do you think beyond the tragedy, beyond the, the human story here, as, as an editor of the major paper in Hong Kong, is this going to be a, a, a story, do you think, that will carry on for a while? Is it possible even to predict? Uh, well, um, as I told Tom just now, actually, I personally, I, I met Liu Xiaobo uh, a couple of times uh, because um, we on, uh, every June 4 anniversary is a big event for Hong Kong media. So even after 1997, uh, I personally, I also went to Beijing to into during this uh, June 4 anniversary, I interviewed different dissidents, including Wang Dan and uh, Liu Xiaobo is one of them. To me, he's always uh, remained as uh, a very moderate, um, quiet, but very determined teller of the in inconvenient truth in China. I mean, personally, I respect him a lot, and his death is uh, such a tragedy. Personally, I, I've also feel very sad for his family. Uh, as um, an editor of the South China Room Post, this is a major story, at least for my paper. Our paper has been keep um, covering Liu Xiaobo's uh, final c conditions over the past week, uh, weeks or so. And we are also preparing a, a leader to be appear in tomorrow's paper to commemorate this um, no. As I said, he's uh, a determined teller of the inconvenient truth of China, and he's uh, a real democracy fighter. Uh, I think in Hong Kong, this is a big news. And um, I also believe in the coming days, there will be uh, still more stories on Liu Xiaobo. Um, Tom asked me just now whether there's, there will be big protests. Honestly, I think there will be protests in Hong Kong for this. And that also comes back to one country, two systems. The fact that in Hong Kong, we can report Liu Xiaobo freely and people can protest against the Chinese government on you know, the, the treatment on Liu Xiaobo. All this actually is, it shows the, the beauty of the two systems. I think only in China, Hong Kong perhaps is the only city that we can do all this <coughs> legally. So that's uh, my personal you know, mm -hmm. reflection on this. Yeah. No, I appreciate your sharing that. Um, so uh, just to come back to the subject at hand, and uh, it's a bit of an odd segue, but um, I'm, I've, I've mentioned, and we've been talking here about where everybody was 20 years ago, people particularly with, with long time history and roots in Hong Kong. So. <laughs> ben Zhang actually is from Anhui province in China and was at Duke University as a student. So he's about as far from, from Hong Kong on July 1st, 1997 as can be. Yeah. Tammy was, uh, was, in was in Beijing covering the story as a Hong Kong TV anchor. But Ronnie, I think I got to pick on you for this one because uh, I knew you'd been in Hong Kong, but Ronnie has some interesting reflections on the rain. <laughs> and interpretations on the rain, and I'm just going to leave it at that. And if you'd like to share those or anything else, okay. Uh, I, I was, you know, usually the bridge don't don't like to invite me to anything. Uh, I'm an outsider. Uh, I'm fiercely independent, such that the Chinese don't invite me, the Beijing people don't, uh, uh, Britain doesn't invite me. Nobody invites me. Uh, maybe that's why I'm in Asia society. But anyway. <laughs> uh, so I was really surprised that the British invited me to the last ceremony uh, and, and because I have consistently turned down every honor, positions, uh, whatever, before 1997 by the British, after 1997 by the Chinese, and just never accept any uh, uh, honors or positions. And so, I, you know, my, my wife and I said, well, if you're invited, why not? Let's go. So it, it rained, you remember, right? You saw the photograph over there. And as we were walking away, uh, there was this uh, old British uh, couple that I've known for decades, good friend of ours. And, 
you know, and, and, and the, the rain, they said, wow. Uh, he, she said, heaven is crying for the leaving or departure of the British. And I said, oh, is that right? Or perhaps uh, heaven is trying to cleanse away all the sins of colonialism. <laughs> But anyway, it depends on how you look at it, you know, <laughs> and uh, the, that, that, that you can interpret it whichever way you want. But I think that this does uh, say something deeper, and that is, you know, the return of Hong Kong really signal, signals the end of an era that lasted 500 years, mm -hmm. and that's colonialism. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't put the Hong Kong return in a greater context. You know, it's a sad chapter of human history called colonialism, but whatever it is, it is. Uh, and you have to accept, you know, facts. Uh, and I think, that, I know Macau w went back two years later, but <coughs> Macau is a little bit small. Yeah. Uh, so Hong Kong really signals the end of a collective history, not mm -hmm. just Hong Kong people. Later we'll go to the Hong Kong people, but the collective history of the world, of the end of the colonialism. And so I think that it was very significant. So my wife and I are so happy uh, that day. Uh, it, uh, the, the only thing is that uh, what I didn't know was the next day is going to be equally good for me. That is, the Asia financial crisis hit, and I bring a lot of money out of it, but anyway, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is another story. Okay. Um, reflections, I mentioned, there have been many. One of the things about doing this event on the 13th of July, rather than, you know, end of June or 1st of July, is we've, I've had just, and, and we've all had the opportunity to read a lot of uh, publications and and, uh, and organizations and people just commenting and, and giving their own reflections. Um, I was taken by this one from The Economist, which uh, uh, wrote a few weeks ago, uh, taking note of what they had said uh, in 1997. So they said, and I'm just interested in, in any of your reflections on this, uh, we as a newspaper expressed hope that Hong Kong would help change China politically. Uh, the opposite is happening. The hand of China is now being felt more than it should. Uh, more than the people of Hong Kong would like. Um, do you think that's right? Do you think they're right? And maybe we start with Ben, just because Ben hasn't, uh, or do you want to stick to financial <laughs> matters? <laughs> well, first of all, I, yeah, I have to admit that I, my experience with Hong Kong is short is here. That's why I have my notebook here. So, so I did a little bit of research regarding the 20 years what happened in Hong Kong. And um, I'll come back to, your, to answer your question yeah. later on. But let me give you a little bit. Numbers, so numbers speak itself, right? So what happened in the, in the last 20 years in Hong Kong as an economy, as a overall? So the GDP growth in the last 20 years, annually 3.2% as a developed economy, better than Japan, better than European unions. As, as a matter of fact, the first quarter this year recorded 4.2% again, right? The FX foreign exchange reserve increased four times, right? I look at employment, the four primary sectors in Hong Kong. For example, the financial sector, which I'm in, increased by 40%. Now, a quarter of a million people work in financial service industry out of 7 million Hong Kong residents. That's pretty high density. And they right? account for 18% of the GDP. Yeah. Then look at tourism sectors. The employment increased by 180%. Then the specialty professional services increased by 70%. I guess lawyers, accounting, a lot of services there. <coughs> so overall economy actually, is, is, I think, is, uh, is doing okay. But to come back to your question, I have an economic answer, um, which is a little bit maybe too, too related to my industry. You know, people feel about recently uh, a lot of Chinese money, mainland Chinese money coming to Hong Kong market by way of Stock and Act so-called southbound, right? Of course, there's northbound money, northbound capital from Hong Kong pour into Shanghai and Shenzhen Stock Exchange as well. Then there's a puzzle. You know, the, the game of stock market is different in Hong Kong and Shanghai Shenzhen. Before, Shanghai is more like uh, storytelling and uh, growth sectors. Hong Kong is more value-driven <clears throat> because you look at the underlying investor structure, 70% Hong Kong investors are institutional investors. They tend to be more value driven. However, more than 80% of mainland stock exchange investors are retail investors. 
So that's the difference. So then now you have this commingle of capital flows. So which actually lead which? <clears throat> we actually did a study. We find out actually, to a lot of people's surprise, is Hong Kong's way of investment, value-driven, actually impacting China, the Shanghai, Shenzhen more than, more than the other way around. Hmm. So, so that's a, as you say, that's a financial look at that's the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I add to what is just of course. said? Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, in the old days when I go around talking to people that are shareholders of mine and potential shareholders of my publicly listed company, I only go to New York and London, basically. And now, like it or not, you have to go to Shanghai and Beijing. Mm -hmm. And that's why Hai Tong and those guys, you know. <laughs> and, and, and also the quality of the research has really, really improved in the last 20 years. And I think that's another area where Hong Kong, uh, unspokenly, unnoticeable to most people, have been affecting mainland China, mm -hmm. to answer your question. Um, and, and, and the corporate governance, I think, is also improving in the mainland because of these uh, interconnectivities between Hong Kong and mainland China economically and financially. But if I'm allowed to go to your question about you know, Hong Kong and uh, who, 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 whether Hong Kong help or, or not, first of all, I believe that Deng Xiaoping, when he started this one country, two system, he no doubt not just have Hong Kong and Taiwan in mind, but he also has mainland China in mind, that perhaps what happened in Hong Kong can be in some ways, if not always, be learned from by mainland China so that it can become useful in mainland China one day. I believe that that must be Deng Xiaoping's uh, behind his thoughts as well. However, the reality is, whereas Hong Kong has you know, helped and influenced China in many, many ways, such as what I just mentioned, uh, China has, mainland China has just gone on so fast that it has, uh, uh, in so many areas, in technology, uh, uh, in so many areas that I think Hong Kong have to be careful. Let's not, and, and the West, sorry to say, of, such as this question, is frozen in time. Mm. That as if, you know, they are always better. I mean, Hong Kong is always better. Mainland China is always behind. In, some, in many areas, still true. Mm -hmm. But also in other areas, we are left behind in Hong Kong. So I think that that question has to be taken with a grain of salt, that uh, uh, a lot of areas, uh, mainly has learned from Hong Kong, but on the other hand, Hong Kong should also learn from China. Finally, so, yeah. finally, um, uh, of course, a lot of people talk about, you know, the, what about politically, you know. Uh, you know, it's really, the, the, the first 10 years, roughly, Beijing really left Hong Kong totally hands off let Hong Kong people take care of Hong Kong, which I fought Beijing for doing that. I understand, I appreciate their good heart. You fought. I fought at yeah, AULT. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I fought them for doing that. Uh, although I understand and appreciate the good heartedness uh, to not meddle in Hong Kong. But the reality is Hong Kong people is undergoing some real serious identity problem. And so uh, as a result, a lot of things are happening as you see. And one of them, uh, is that there is always a small sector, se segment of society who wants, uh, the, who are extremists. Every society has that. In Hong Kong, for example, have you ever seen the, the, the video that uh, a, a, a soccer game in Hong Kong when the national team played the Hong Kong team? Uh, 50 university students, when the national anthem was played, they turned the back against the flag. This is the August audience. I should be careful. And I, I'm the co-chair of the Asian Society, so I never should use bad words. But they gave the flag the middle finger. Mm. And they chanted, and the only, sorry, French word I know start with the F, Beijing. They chanted that. And that's too much. Mm. And so I think that, you know, and these things, if you are sitting in Beijing, you don't, you know, you, you, you would think twice, what's going on in Hong Kong? The union flag waving in Hong Kong. So I think that uh, uh, I, I can see why Beijing is a little bit cautious also, and uh, say, hey, come on guys, one country. Okay, I have a lot of follow-ups, but one leads right to, to Tammy, which is <clears throat> you've said, you said something to me, and we, we had limited time earlier about, um, in your view, neither side, well, I shouldn't put words in your mouth, but just the, the difficulties on both sides with one country, two systems. And I think you've written about this in your paper, but, but yeah. you can explain what you think those are. And, and feel free to disagree with Ronnie, too, if you like. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, I'm a journalist, so I, I always have a critical mind. Uh, well, I, that recalls me something, you know, um, on 
so on on June the thirtieth uh, and July the first, I was in Beijing and um, I. Twenty years ago. Twenty years ago, yeah. I was uh, still with a TV at the time. So throughout the whole day, I was uh, doing live coverage from Tiananmen Square, and I saw this uh, jubilant, joyful crowd in Tiananmen Square in Beijing. And then I call call back to my office in Hong Kong. I think, hey, hey guys, what's happening in Hong Kong? It's always oh, it's, it's, uh, pouring, and everybody's feel, feeling kind of upset. And I honestly because of the rain. Uh, but whatever. <clears throat> but honestly, I think I I had a very much kind of a mixed feeling when I stood in Tiananmen Square, because it's all this kind of uh, uncertainty. I really don't know next morning, next day, what will happen to Hong Kong. I believe many of my colleagues back in the newsroom they share my the, the same similar kind of uh, sentiment. That also reminds me during the I, I was I have been in, in Beijing for many years covering the transition you know the, the Sino British talks on the Hong Kong transitions. And the Chinese officials kept telling us, they said, hey, 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 Hong Kong reporters, don't worry, don't worry. Uh, when July the first come, except the change of the flag, nothing will change. Everything will remain the same. So I kept asking the question, is it that simple for one country, two system to implement? Does it mean just uh, the change of threat? Any, anything will, will not change? So I, 20 years after looking back, I think that that has been a painful learning process for both Beijing and for Hong Kong people as well. Because as Deng Xiaoping said, that there's no successful precedent, no reference. Nobody knows what this one country, two system is. So everybody's kind of uh, you know, crossing the river by touching the stones. I, 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 I use Deng Xiaoping's quote. They don't know how to do it. So at the beginning, uh, it's my, my experience, when, when I interviewed all these Beijing officials, the Chinese officials, I asked them what's this one country system all about. Oh, they said, oh, uh, what we need to do is to protect the interest of capitalism. We just want to protect capitalism. And to them, their understanding is to protect the interest of the business. Well, wrong is from the business. I'm, I'm not offending you. But mm -hmm. Hong Kong is much more complicated. It's not just for the interest of the business that can keep Hong Kong, you know, everything can be, is, is, is rosy, is right. And on the other hand, Hong Kong people, we are also learning. I mean, before 1997, we were under the British rule. We, um, we were asked to do whatever the British government was asked to do. So af after 1997, we think that we are, we are the master of the city. We want to make our own decision. And Hong Kong people become more demanding to the government as well. However, there are so many things, you know, Besides just protecting the, the interests of the business, we have our housing problem, we have our, our mm -hmm. <coughs> poverty, <coughs> education, young people, and plus the Asian financial crisis the next year. So everything seems went wrong in Hong Kong. So people started to, to, to think about it. As, as a media person, um, I once thought, thought about it, I, I should change my career after 1997 because I thought there would be no big news, everything would be settled. However, I yeah. came to realize <laughs> the big news just started after 1997. It's a great time to be in your position, isn't it? I think so. Until today, I, that's why I, I'm still staying in this uh, business, you know, in journalism. So I think. Um, for the very beginning, China wants to give us a free hand. So I don't mind your business and you don't mind my business either. Uh, until 2003, uh, because of SARS and the, the legislature of the national security <coughs> law and many things, and then half a million people marched to the streets. And Beijing started to think, hey, hey, let, let's, let me give you some preferential policies. So they sent us the tourists. And they gave us uh, SIPA, uh, and they gave us um, economic, uh, <coughs> many other economic uh, no, policies. However, people didn't seem happy either. I, from a journalist's perspective, I think it's because all these policies is kind of a one-way. 
And still, in the eyes of many ordinary Hong Kong you know, people, it still benefits the business. Not very much benefit to the, to the you know, people in the streets. Um, like in the United States? With Donald yeah. Trump? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this time when President Xi Jinping came to Tang to, to mark the 20th anniversary of Hong Kong's uh, return to, to, to China, um, people, some people also talk about whether President Xi will brought with him some big gifts to Hong Kong. Economic gifts. Um, because Hong Kong people just kind of get used to, you know, whenever a state leader came to, came to town, they, they must brought with them some kind of a <laughs> gifts to Hong Kong, which means as uh, policies. And, but this time, uh, I came to realize there is a gift, but not the conventional way. The gift was, uh, she, President Xi told us, to Hong Kong, you need to grab the opportunity of the country's development. You be part of the country's development, like the One Belt, One Road and the Greater Bay Area the projects. So you, you should be part of that national development project and to develop <coughs> together with the country rather than just you know, I give you something and then you, know, you do it your way. So I think there is a, a number of adjustments uh, for Beijing's Hong Kong policy over the past 20 years. To me, that's a learning process for, for mainland China and for Hong Kong people as well. We need to try to also understand why Beijing did this and did that. So that's my mm -hmm. kind of... Uh, Just one quick follow-up, and again, for any of you. He, um, there are many interpretations written about President Xi's speech, but um, he used the, the term, I don't know what it is in Mandarin, red lines. Um, any attempt to endanger China's sovereignty and security, challenge the power of the central government, uh, or use Hong Kong to carry out infiltration and sabotage activities against the mainland is an act that crosses the red line. Absolutely impermissible. How do you read that? I mean, we all have our own interpretations, I guess. And, and how did that go over to your point about how Hong Kong people feel? How was that felt and received in Hong Kong? OK. Uh, actually, uh, his, uh, in Chinese, he used the term uh, bottom line. Di xian. Di xian. It's bottom line. Uh, well, that's quite different. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think let me come back to President Xi's visit to Hong Kong. This is um, big news in Tang, and we have covered that uh, extensively. Um, to me, the most important message from President Xi's visit throughout his three days uh, stay in Hong Kong actually is uh, this one country. It's his emphasis on one country. Um, without one country, there won't be two systems. So uh, using his, his terms, uh, one country is the root and two systems is the, the tree. Only when the, the root can be strong, strong uh, and, and firm can the tree can grow uh, you know, healthily. Um, by pointing out this is the bottom line, you cannot advocate independence. That's the bottom line. Besides that, Actually, what strikes me the most is he modified a Chinese uh, proverb, uh, Chen Yu, proverb. Uh, a proverb. Uh, the Chinese proverb was uh, let's putting aside some minor differences by si and, and seeking common grounds. And he changed these uh, minor differences into major differences. So the term becomes let's seek common ground by putting aside major differences. By saying that, he also pointed out that Hong Kong does have lots of problems, housing, youth, uh, education, and also Hong Kong still uh, lack of uh, new engine for its economic development. He pointed out all these uh, different uh, problems Hong Kong is now facing and acknowledged major differences in Hong Kong. So I think that's very important. Um, it means Beijing realized Hong Kong is such a pluralized society. There are bound to be different views in Hong Kong. You cannot ask Hong Kong people to just come to just one opinion. That's impossible. So, but as long as no advocacy on independence, 
everything we can we can talk about this. So we can see this common ground. Actually, this is quite consistent with uh, Beijing's handling with Taiwan and all the other mm -hmm. issues, yeah. like Taiwan uh, in Sino-U.S. relations. It's so also um, as long as uh, we stick to the one-China <coughs> policy, anything can be negotiable. But in terms of sovereignty and one-China principle, it's been always non-negotiable right. for Beijing. So that's my yeah. understanding. Yeah. 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 No, I appreciate it. And and just to come back now, Ben, maybe to something. You and Ronnie both started on a moment ago, which is the rise, which is another thing that I think very few people, although people as savvy about these things as you two probably could have anticipated, but which is just the skyrocketing meteoric rise of these other great financial juggernauts, in, particularly in southern China, okay. that we couldn't have imagined. Now you, um, you know, so, so I guess specifically we're talking, you've mentioned Beijing, but Shanghai and Shenzhen. So the question is, is Hong Kong at any risk of losing its edge yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. in that space? Sure. Uh, Ronnie, can I go first? Please, please. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I also want to actually answer part of your, your, your uh, formal question. I think, you know, let me quote. Um, so basically, um, Hong Kong is a neighboring city, which by bus is one hour away, right? So the Shenzhen, Shenzhen now the GDP overall will surpass Hong Kong as a whole. And also, by Innovation Index, Shenzhen has surpassed Hong Kong as number one in among Chinese big cities. Why is that? So I, Shenzhen doesn't have one country to system, right? So Shenzhen doesn't have this capitalism system, the good infrastructure Hong Kong enjoyed already. But Shenzhen has entrepreneurship. Shenzhen has a bravery mm. to lose, right? I actually, I had a house in Shenzhen, so I commuted before. I also worked briefly in Shenzhen for two years. I clearly feel the difference between Hong Kong and Hong Kong and Shenzhen, right? So let me quote, don't ask what your country can do for you. <laughs> what you can do for yourself first. I think as a, Good. by a few months later, I'll be, I'll be in Hong Kong for seven years. So can I call if, if I claim can I claim Hong Kong permanent residency, right? Absolutely, anybody, <laughs> seven years. So, mm, welcome. So the, in that way, actually, I, I feel ownership of Hong Kong, right? But I feel a little bit sorry, left behind. But, you know, Hong Kong has, has been ranked by number one as a global financial centers by different indexes. I look at those indexes by different, what dimension Hong Kong does best. Okay, here I quote a few, few index dimensions, okay? By, Business environment, cost of doing business, Hong Kong ranked number one. Okay, government efficiency, Hong Kong ranked number one. But economic performance, mediocre. Infrastructure, getting old, not great. Human capital, human capital, Hong Kong actually losing ground a little bit. For example, took me more than 12 months to hire a compliance manager. You know, compliance, we're getting more com you know, compliance works. So I have to hire one person from New York to put in Hong Kong, <coughs> okay? So I'm thinking about uh, Hong Kong has such great university system, right? Mm. Why don't we just, we gotta just start a compliance program? So this, those things I think make me thinking, you know, the, the, um, the Hong Kong actually is, a, will have a bright future, but you know, Hong Kong, as a new Hong Kongese myself, we need to catch up more with even with our neighboring cities. Let me also give you some, some, some striking uh, comparisons. 20 years ago, in Hong Kong capital markets, the leak table, the leak table means the, the who, who are the investment banks did the most IPOs for the companies. All of the 10 companies are global companies, global investment banks. Now 20 years later today, out of the 10 companies, only one, don't ask me who is that, are global companies. All nine are Chinese hmm. companies based in Hong Kong. Wow. That's the difference. Like Hai Tong, you know, I have a few colleagues here. We use Hong Kong as our base. So we call our Hong Kong our home. But we didn't stop here. We actually buy a few companies. We build a few companies. We got office in New York, London, Tokyo, Singapore. In India, I was in India last week. So um, I think our business 
we actually not only survive, but we thrive mm-hmm. in Hong Kong. So uh, we hope you know, to, you know, our peers mm-hmm. that can do more like this to make Hong Kong better. So losing its edge a little bit. By the way, in terms of, of Shenzhen, uh, this may be one statistic that is not in your notebook, but I thought was fascinating. So I, I almost can't believe it, but in 2016, more skyscrapers were constructed in Shenzhen than in the United States and Australia combined. Wow. I mean, I don't know how many skyscrapers are going up in Australia, but... Uh, uh, Ronnie, did you want to well, add yeah. to that? Uh, let me, again, put things in a little historic perspective. Hong Kong has always been a just a, one city, a very good, vibrant, small city, but very, very good. And we always service everybody else. We are externally oriented. We don't have, you know, uh, agriculture or manufacturing. We just don't have the land for it, right? And so after Second World War, we serviced mainly the United States, only country that have money. And then later, as Europe began to rise, we serviced Europeans, and then Japan, right, and Southeast Asia. And it's just a natural progression of global economy. The last 20 years, the biggest name, biggest game in economics uh, arena is the rise of China. So, you know, there are some people who are still frozen in time that says, why should, you know, why should it be now nine out of 10 I mean, a Chinese company? I said, you know, it used to be none of the American firms were there 25 years ago when I, 30 years ago when I started. Uh, and then you begin to hear Goldman Sachs. I never heard of Goldman Sachs before, 30 some years ago. And then Goldman Sachs came, Merrill Lynch came, J.P. Morgan came. Nobody said, hey, how come now nine of the 10 are American companies? Nobody ever said that. We just accepted it because we are always an open society, an open economy. And so now with the, the significance of the economic rise of China, so if more Chinese companies come and play, why not? Right. A lot of people say, hey, Ronnie, you're in real estate, and now all the real estate, the land are all bought by mainland Chinese company, and so it hurts your business. I said, well, it's, it's not a matter of me. Uh, you know, 30 years ago, uh, 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 the, 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 the Japanese com- companies mm-hmm. came. 20 years ago, the American companies came. And everybody come and go in Hong Kong. And now it's a mainland Chinese coming, 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 coming. And I'll be happy to bet that the first wave of them, they will lose a lot of money. And so be it. We don't care. <laughs> you make money, more power to you. You lose money, your problem. Nobody yeah. will have a gun to, you, to your head that you have to be there. Right? But as uh, Ben alluded to it, Hong Kong is not the end game. For these mainland Chinese companies, Hong Kong is too small to be the end game. Mm. But Hong Kong is a place where they can learn, they can you know, uh, hone their skill in the international uh, 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 global economic system, and then they're going to go everywhere else. And you know, that's Hong Kong function historically. So mm. it's, it's, it's really uh, no big deal that now we're servicing one client whether the other. Uh, allow me to co- uh, stay away from the business for uh, 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 a bit and come back to what Tammy have just said. And that is Hong Kong people, you, you, you started but without finishing, uh, you, uh, that is, you know, Beijing has to learn, Hong Kong has to learn too, and you, you mentioned, I fully agree with you. But let me mention one or two points about the Hong Kong people undergoing tremendous amount of change in terms of their self-identity. You don't live there, and so you may not be so aware of it. Under the British, we will, sh- we will make sure that we don't feel like we're British. In 1977, roughly, the Parliament of England, already, Britain, already passed a bill that says Hong Kong people cannot live in the United States, uh, live in the United Kingdom. And so they were afraid that the Hong Kong people will have a British identity because we will all want to move to Britain. Uh, especially with 1997 in view. Then the Chinese, Chinese have a terrible history in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and even into the 80s. So the Hong Kong people look down on them because they are poor, and, you know, and, and they, are, they have a very troubled, uh, checkered history. So we don't want to be the Chinese. Mm. So what are we? <laughs> we're not British, we're not Chinese, what are we? We're Hongkies, as the Singaporeans call, <laughs> or the Hong Kongers, uh, as we call ourselves. Uh, and. Uh, but then that is always uh, something that is in, uh, unofficial. You don't talk about it. You are so, sort of navigating between the British identity and the Chinese identity. We always live on borrow time and borrow place. 
for the first time after 1997, the, top, the clock stopped ticking. No more borrow time. And the flag has changed, so no more borrow place. And so Hong Kong people have to begin to find our own self-identity. Uh, what is our relationship to mainland China? Are we Chinese or are we not Chinese? Nobody asked that question for 150 years because the British make sure you don't ask that question. Now we have no choice but to ask that question. Then finally, we have a second com layer of complication, and that is vis-a-vis -vis guys like Ben. His last name is Zhang, Z-H-A-N-G. In Hong Kong, there's no Zhang 30 C years ago. C-H-A-N-G, right? These are obviously from mainland, okay. That's so, the difference, <laughs> difference between Cantonese and the Mandarin, right? So, so, in the old days, we have a superiority complex. We feel we are better. Zhang? Are you? No good. <laughs> right? But now, these Zhangs, are all Duke graduate, Harvard graduate, MIT graduates. A lot of them have PhDs. You have a PhD? Anyway, you have one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what does that do for me? I used to have a superior contact. I didn't, but you know, Hong Kong people are You are. Generally. You always <laughs> Now, a lot of Hong Kong people have an inferiority complex. They look at guys that are, hey, that guy got a PhD. And he is high paying. He is uh, whatever. And, and then you have all the tourists come to Hong Kong. In the old days, we looked down on them. They just buy toilet papers. Right? <laughs> now, they buy uh, 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 Van Cleef, no, they buy uh, companies, Chanel, buy companies and companies, now. companies as companies well. Now. And, so, and so Hong, and Hong Kong people is undergoing also uh, a identity crisis. Well, I won't call it crisis, but just an involvement uh, that is uh, corollary or, or maybe ancillary to the 1997 a return of Hong Kong to China. So I think that Hong Kong, it, it would take some time. No one can change their self-identity that fast. So Hong Kong people you know, is in the process. I think that in the long run, as long as mainland China is doing okay, Hong Kong will be fine, not just economically, but also in terms of our self-identity vis-a-vis mainland China, the motherland, as well as vis-a-vis -vis the people from mainland. So you are more than welcome. Seven years, oh, thank you. three stars in, <laughs> in your identity card. So you may have noticed I've been handed the iPad, which means we're going to come to questions in a minute, and there are a lot in here, and so I'm going to toss out my own remaining stack, except to come to, um, I, I said to, uh, I think I said to Ben uh, before the panel, so as you probably know, the whole arrangement was a 50-year arrangement, that, that whatever the, the benefits or problems with one country, two systems, and the long process that uh, Tammy mentioned she covered of getting to, uh, to an agreement and arrangement between the British and, and Hong Kong and China was going to go till 2047. And 2047, of course, when we stood there in the rain 20 years ago, seemed like, you know, that was just, I mean, it was really far away. It suddenly, you know, somebody said you take a 30-year mortgage out now, that gets you right to 2047, right? <laughs> um, be that as it may, if... Reflect, if you will, or not reflect, but, but give us a couple of thoughts about whether from a business standpoint, a political freedom standpoint, a one country, two system standpoint, where do you see Hong Kong circa 2047? Can I, can I get the easiest part? Can you, sure. I, I think, everybody. Yeah. I, I think let me use one, uh, one example. As, uh, you, know, you, you never know what will happen in the, in, in the next uh, uh, five or even 20 years. Uh, for example, um, if you want to invest by stocks listed in Shanghai or Shenzhen, you got to go through so-called QFI, QFII, a Qualified Foreign Institution Investor Program, which is basically you need to get a quota. So everything you need to go to Beijing a couple of times, get a license, get a quota. Right? Then in 2014, there's a Stock Connect program coming out. Actually, you don't need a quota anymore. You just open the account in Hong Kong, like with Haitong. Of course, I don't. Uh, <laughs> just like a regular Hong Kong stock broker, uh, broker account. Then you can buy Chinese the stocks in listing Shanghai and Shenzhen. And I think you know, that that's actually looks similar, but the underlying, the playing rule is different because you, because you open an account in Hong Kong. So you have to be kyc by us, people like us, know your clients. You have to abide by Hong Kong security law, not the Chinese. 
by the QFI. So I think that's in business sense, finance sense, that's one example of what could happen in a few years. That could be you know, one example of you know, one market, two system. So predicting you know, what happened after 2014, 2047, I think Hong Kong will do well. You know, I've been living in New York, work in New York for seven years, work at you know, investment, global investment banks. I studied, worked in Shanghai also for seven years. Now I live in Hong Kong plus Shenzhen area for seven years. Among all these three places, some share commonality. You just mentioned, you know, those outsiders, you do better. Actually, Shanghainese has that straight as well. Everybody outside, outside <laughs> Shanghai called the peasants, or farmers, <laughs> right? So, but Hong Kong, Hong Kong is part of southern China. It's, I think people are very down to earth, very business driven. There's a, few, there's a good, good opportunity lying behind. Lying behind is, uh, for example, the uh, Great Bay Area. Right, the, this 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 scheme, this actually only five percent of population, but fifteen percent of the GDP of China, has a great opportunity. I think Hong Kong can do better if can participate more, not just a cross border linkage, not so called superconductor, but can do more. For example, do more fundraising, provide more professional services to this. This will work much better for Hong Kong. Anybody else on twenty forty seven Hong Kong? What, what will be on the front pages of your paper? <laughs> we might not have the paper yeah. edition anymore. I don't know. Yeah. Who knows <laughs> at the time? Well, uh, I just want to uh, share with you some of my own thoughts on this uh, 50 years. I, I do believe when Deng Xiaoping mentioned this, you know, 50 years on change, uh, does not necessarily just mean this physically 50 years. I think it all depends on Hong Kong's value to China. Why, why Beijing wanted to give Hong Kong two systems? I think, I also believe it's all because China is Hong Kong. You know. There are some people saying that, oh, if uh, China in the 80s with China of today, with such a, you know, so, so powerful, there might, might probably no two systems. But well, who knows? We don't know. After all, we are already being given this one country, two systems. And Deng Xiaoping has, has uh, stressed for a couple of times, let's make several more Hong Kongs in mainland China. So we, we all understand Hong Kong has made great contribution to China's opening up over the past 30 years. Until today, even some people kind of arguing, saying that oh, Hong Kong is losing uh, our edge and uh, our advantage is being diminished, uh, I am still uh, kind of uh, optimistic. I do believe in Hong Kong we have our different legal systems, and we have, most of all, we have uh, our free flow in, of information, for free press. Uh, in Hong Kong, there's no ban on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. Uh, this is you know, free flow of information is very important for business and all, all that. So I still believe um, Hong Kong can play a unique role to China. In that sense, uh, even after 50 years, if the one country, two systems are going on well, why the trouble to change it? So I, I don't see that, so I, I'm still the kind of uh, optimistic person. I have a very pragmatic answer. <laughs> tell me what China will be like in 2047, and I'll tell you what will happen to Hong Kong. Yeah, good, good answer. And, and the, re the, the reality yeah. is, every five years, you use your greatest imagination to imagine what China will be like five years later, and for the last 30 some years, everyone has been wrong every time. <clears throat> and just look back 20 years ago, uh -huh. yeah. what was Hong Kong like? Uh, sorry, what was mainland China like and what it is like today? I was just in Shenzhen recently. Uh, My, whew, amazing, right? So 30 years later, that's still, still a, quite a bit of time. And what will China be like economically, socially, politically? Wh who knows? Yeah, yeah. And so, but whatever it is, I agree with Tammy that Hong Kong being a small entrepreneur starting, it's a sp small economy, small population. We have to service everybody. We have to prove our worth. Uh, uh, it is said that respect is not to be demanded but, get, but earned. Mm -hmm. Same thing with economic success. Mm -hmm. 
And if we want to be successful, you cannot demand it of Beijing and hence always, as Tammy says, expecting gift, gift. You know, economic gift from Beijing. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, it, you, we eventually, we have to find our own way and find our own, own role in the greater picture of uh, the China's economic advance. You know, Li Kuan Yew says the one thing that he admires Hong Kong, I'm sure other things as well, is Hong Kong's geographic location. <laughs> <laughs> if Singapore has a geographic location, wow, right? And yet Hong Kong people, because of the self-identity issue that I, I, I raised as a, one of the many reasons, uh, one of the many issues, uh, have not been taking full advantage mm -hmm. of that economic uh, uh, opportunity. Hopefully, when we find our own identity, we will then also find our role in the greater uh, economic uh, picture of the growth of China. The world is breaking down the walls and doors to get to China. And Hong Kong is the only place that says, stay away, stay away, stay away. And some Westerners make sure that we, hey, stay away, we're different, we're different. Well, politically, of course, one can do system. Why, why bother to go do away with the two system? Hey, that's working well, 30 more, year, 30 more years, wonderful, right? But economically, if you're still talking about, hey, I'm different, sorry. We businessmen are not that foolish. We go where the opportunities are. We, my father invested in U.S. stocks in the, 50, in the 60s because that's where the growth was. And then he invested in the Japanese stock in the 70s. And now where do you invest? In mainland China, that's where the economic growth is. So I think that we, uh, we, we have tremendous opportunities ahead of us. I have no question that Hong Kong will continue to thrive economically, uh, but the process will take a little, little bit of time, find our own self-identity and our role vis-a-vis -vis the mainland of China. Then we will rise even further. Thank you. Mindful of time, and I do want to uh, just come into the iPad. So if you have questions, raise your hand. We'll get a mic to you. Uh, we have a couple of very provocative and very similar sounding questions. Normally people send questions, I think, before the event, but these two guys are definitely paying attention. So let's honor Adam and Nate, whoever you are and wherever you're watching or listening. Uh, it's to this question about turning their backs on the flag in China. So I'm, I'm taking two and conflating them here a little bit. So what if they turn their backs on the flag of China? Isn't this just dissatisfaction over Beijing? meddling into the wishes of the special administrative region. Why would they not express dissatisfaction? Why is Beijing so insecure? And then Nate goes into uh, similar questions and finishing with, why is it so unreasonable for people to want to choose their own leader? First of all, about choosing the leader. Hong Kong is not a sovereign state. Hong Kong is a city inside of a country. I don't care how you do it, whichever way you do it, it cannot be incongruent with the rest of the country. You don't like the way Beijing is, you have your liberty. But as far as Hong Kong is concerned, as a very special SAR city of China, politically, we have to work in the greater context. If not, you're talking about sedition, you're talking about, you know, independence. It's just, it's just not in the cards, not in the game. And it is, we cannot do that. And, and as far as, you know, what's wrong with uh, giving middle finger to uh, uh, the, the, the flag, I said, do you think that in this country, if somebody were to give the middle finger to the, the flag, the, 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 the citizen would accept that? I know that some soccer play, uh, some b basketball players or, or football players, they did not salute the flag or, or, or something like that, right? But that's not like when they chanted publicly. I mean, F Beijing, pardon my language. I mean, I, I have to say it that way. That's the only way I know how to say it because that's how, what they said. It. Uh, and so, you know, it is. And, and it goes back to my issue of what is the identity of Hong Kong. Hong Kong is far more complicated than most people think. And in America, you never have a question of being one country. Even in your dollar bill, it talks about what e pluribum, whatever that, that word is, unum, right? You have the unum there. <coughs> but in Hong Kong, we never had a sense of being one country. Because Britain 
this about us. We didn't want to be part of China, and then we became part of China. So I think that that identity is something that has to foster over a period of time. Uh, and since we cannot be independent, so you have to learn to live with the system. You want to overthrow Beijing? Go right ahead. Count me out. Okay. Uh, Minky, and then we'll take one in the back. If you can say who you are, keep it kind of tight. I'm sorry I've left uh, not that much time. Yes. Thank you. I'm Minky Warden from Human Rights Watch. And thank you to the Asia Society for keeping the spotlight on Hong Kong. Uh, uh, at Human Rights Watch, we have documented over a 20-year period that every repressive act from Beijing, for example, the Patriotic Education Program, creates the next generation of critics. It created Joshua Wong, for example. And it was distressing to see that the Asia Society in Hong Kong has turned down the opportunity to hear from pan-democrats. So I'd like to ask Mr. Chan if he's prepared to commit on the spot that Hong Kong will have the free flow of information that, that Tammy Tam has referenced, and that includes hearing from peaceful critics, whatever their political views. Good seeing you. I actually, yeah. Please, yeah. I, I just, I, I don't mean to interrupt Ronnie, but I, just to be clear, because this has been unclear in a lot of this, I run global programming for the Asia Society, so I, you know, and, and Ronnie's feel free to add anything you like. Um, I think you've probably seen our statement on the Joshua Wong business. We have actually invited him um, in the aftermath of this to come to an event. There were mistakes made, and that's in our statement as well. Uh, but our commitment is full-throated, as, uh, and I'm not sure everybody here knows what we're talking about. Happy to discuss it afterwards <laughs> with you. Uh, it's it's full-throated, it's unmitigated, and uh, and you can take that to the bank. I'll yes, make, oh, go ahead. I'll, I'll make it very, very simple. First of all, as the chairman of Asia Society in Hong Kong, we have stayed away from politics. Local politics in particular, but we stay away from that for the last 30 years, 20 some years that we've been there. We cover, as an institution, we cover business and policy. It's policy, not politics, okay? Number two, education. And number three, art and culture. We don't, we are apolitical, we don't cover politics. That's why under my chairmanship in Hong Kong for the last 20 some years, I have never invited once the pro-establishment camp to say a word about local politics, never. Check our programs. We never invited the pro-establishment camp and we're not gonna invite anybody if I have my grudges. So why should we do programs? Why should we be dragged into local politics? I'll brief, I'll program, our intention is to do arts, uh, business and policy, education, arts and culture. As simple as that. So does every organization in the world has to do everything, such as get dragged into the fight between Hillary and Donald Trump? If I'm in a hospital business, do I, or a hospital, I, I run a nonprofit hospital, do I have to get involved in politics between the Democrats and the Republicans? It's just not what we do. We have never let the pro-establishment camp do it. Why should we let anybody else do it? Now, so that said, it is said that Ronnie Chan is meddling in the programming. Well, first of all, I am the chairman. I get involved in many things. I was in California last Thursday. I read about it in the newspaper. Then I wrote a note to our executive director in Hong Kong. I said, what's going on? I have no idea what's happening here. I read about it in the newspaper, and of course the newspaper said uh, Ronnie Chan is kowtowing to Beijing. You know, can you be a little objective and honest and look at facts rather than calling names? Calling names is not going to help anything. And in Asian society, we generate not heat, but light. We just don't cover certain things. I don't care whether you're pro-establishment or anti-government or whatever. We don't cover it. That's all. Can, we have the, can I have the liberty to do that? Thank you. <coughs> yep. Hello, I'm Sina from Mont Blanc. I have a question for my generation. 20 years ago, I was already overseas as a Chinese immigrants. So I grew up in Japan, 
later on my family moved to the United States, from other people's eyes, we're just Chinese Americans. So I have a question for Mr. Chan. As the co-chair of Asia Society, what efforts are put into place for unity? Um, for my generation, this is all very... For me very, to play? Oh. <laughs> for, for unity. Um, for unity. 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 Oh, I see. Because we're, you know, from my generation, this is all very educational. We're very educated about it. However, in our generation's eyes and perspective, we are really confused because the Japanese and the Koreans, they seem bonded among each other within their own community. However, my experience growing up, my peers may be first generation growing up overseas or born overseas. Uh, we just don't see the same level of unity among Chinese. And then w through these educational platforms, we learn more about it. Yes, there are things happening at home which cost here. So as the co-chair and possibly a mentor for a young generation like myself, what efforts are you personally and your organizations are put into to educate us while promoting and uh, you know supporting what's happening in Hong Kong and mainland China? What's more importantly, what's happening here in North America that you're helping us to, to realize that we're Chinese Americans together and then we're very strong and then we're recognized as one strong identity. Thank you. Well, you know, Dr. Sun Yat-sen, the father of modern China, said the Chinese people are like a bowl of loose sand. Yipan sand sha. And that is just the way the Chinese are. I don't know if I can change anything. <laughs> I, 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 I'm just five foot three, a small guy. I'm nobody, you know. Uh, but I just do whatever I believe is right and, and, and good for society. And, and that's all. Now, we do some programs on, you know, uh, Asian Americans and so forth in this country. I'll leave it to Tom to address that. But, you know, there are so many things to cover. But mainly, we are back to the three pillars that we do, business and policy, education, and, uh, and, and arts and culture. Uh, and we try to, you know, we cannot be everything to everyone. But privately, person, you know, in, per, personally, if you want, want to discuss such issue, I'll be very happy to talk to you, uh, and <coughs> we'll see what we can do. <laughs> I'm just take you up after, on lunch, after lunch, <laughs> That's what she after lunch. After lunch. On, on the subject of young people, different question, uh, actually from uh, Susie Jakes at China File here at the Asia Society. So this has to do with polls about uh, self-identification. Ronnie, you talked about Hong Kong identity. That, uh, and I'll spare all the numbers here, but um, that the numbers of young Hong Kongers these days who identify themselves as uh, um, as Chinese, and the, the choices here are Hong Konger, Hong Konger in China, Chinese, mixed identity. And we're down to 93.7 uh, um, who identify as, or we're up to 93.7 who identify primarily or exclusively as Hong Kongers, and that number has steadily risen. Uh, over the years, and the implication there being, well, I'm not sure what the, how do you take that, and, and that must be something, Tammy, you're well aware of in your paper. I'm sorry if I mangled yeah. the numbers, Susie, but... Uh, um, uh, well, this has been um, always a uh, hot topic for my paper, uh, young people's identity and young people's, uh, you know, their, their sense of uh, belonging to the country, and uh, there has been always, uh, we have uh, covered lots of uh, different polls, and... Um, with uh, different, uh, you know, outbacks on, on these issues. Um, I think there is really some, something wrong in Hong Kong. I mean, for the young people, they got so frustrated. So we, we talk about this, um, there may be lots of uh, factors contributed to, to these issues. First of all, there is, uh, we, we, we talk about this um, upward mobility opportunities for young people. Hong Kong's housing is getting more and more unaffordable. For young people, it's just simply impossible for them to afford any you know, housing. And uh, also, I think Ronnie has pointed out uh, over the past few days, because uh, we are now having... Um, Hong Kong is uh, an aging society. People are getting aging. But... Um, According to WHO's latest uh, criteria, when you are 60 years old, you're still a uh, middle age or something. 
So the retirement age is getting you know, higher and higher. And the young people today, they, they really feel frustrated that they, they see less opportunities. I think that's why uh, our new chief executive has put uh, education as the top priority of her new administration. And youth issue was also one of the key problems that President Xi Jinping pointed out during his visit in Hong Kong. So I, I, I mean, it's, um, young people is our future. Uh, young people's issue, it is a problem in Hong Kong. It's uh, for the government and for the, I mean, for the private sectors and how we can work together to provide more opportunities for our young people. So that's just my mm-hmm. understanding of the issue. I, I think it's a real issue for Hong Kong. Yeah. Yeah. And I would compel uh, yeah. any of you who are interested in, in more on that subject, uh, or we haven't even gotten into, into Carrie Lam and, and her road ahead, but um, Tammy's written some very good stuff in the South China Morning Post recently about what she calls the rough ride ahead for her, uh, for Carrie Lam. And I think you said or you quoted somebody saying, can't imagine why on earth anybody would want that job right now. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it's good it's stuff. a tough job. Yeah. We are, I think, a minute past the hour. I'm going to give the last word, actually, to somebody not in the room. Uh, we talked about Chris Patton and, uh, and Prince Charles wandering off uh, on the Royal Yacht Britannia uh, 20 years ago. I frankly hadn't really known what had happened to Chris Patton. He had some comments. Obviously, a lot of people were looking for him, and, and some of them were quite critical. But he, he said this uh, about Hong Kong. Uh, it remains a terrific city, one of the freest cities in Asia. That is not because of Beijing. It's certainly not because of Great Britain. It's because of the people of Hong Kong. So uh, on that well note, said. Yeah, uh, uh, on that note, I want to thank you all, but particularly if you can uh, uh, put your hands together to thank our panelists. Uh, thank you, Ben. And Ronnie.